Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, thanks for waiting for our guest from UW to brave the weather and the traffic and arrive today. Oh, because of all the wind. Yeah, so hopefully we'll keep our power on for the whole, the whole talk. That's always exciting when we get a windstorm. If not, we'll simulate blindness. That's right. That's right. That's a good way to uh, make lemons out of lemonade out of lemons. So anyway, I wanted to introduce uh, the latest speaker in our joint uh, UW MSR Accessibility Seminar, um, and it's a speaker from our own company, Microsoft. So uh, Wendy Chisholm is going to talk to us today about her own vision of uh, inclusive design and how that might dovetail with Microsoft's vision of <laughs> inclusive design. So I'm sure we're all intrigued to learn more about that. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, hello. So and I used to be at University of Washington, so this is a nice little uh, venue for me to be stepping between worlds and have both my worlds here. So that's fantastic. So anyway, well, thank you for being here today, braving the bridge and everything. Um, what I'm going to do today, as Mary said, is kind of give you a vision of, of how I see the world. Um, and I see it that it's designed for people no matter what your abilities are. Um, it's kind of the next round in civil rights movements, right, the disability rights movement. Um, but it's a really cool engineering problem. And so I'm going to talk about how I got here as an engineer and kind of where I think we're going, as Mary said, um, pulling Microsoft and the rest of the industry along. Because there's some very cool developments going on throughout the industry that uh, I think we can all be playing off of each other. So, take a little journey with me. My goal, and this is for everybody, but of course now that I'm at Microsoft, my goal is for Microsoft products, to be accessible at the alpha release. And so, um, I won't get into if they have or not in the past, but we'll be looking forward in this presentation um, because I've only been here for four months. So I'm, I'm the new kid on the block and I have no idea how business works. This is my first corporate job. So this has been an amazing and very fun learning experience. So anyway, I'm an idealist. I'll totally admit that as well. So you can see that uh, what I'll be doing in, in this presentation is starting to assimilate more of these worlds as I expand my world view. So. Anyway, how am I going to get there? Well, today I'm going to talk a bit about me and how I got here. I'm also going to talk about some myths that I've encountered throughout the industry when I talk to people about accessibility and inclusion and people with disabilities. And then um, we'll look at how we can move things forward, whether you're at Microsoft or not. So a bit about me. I have a whole bunch of acronyms. And I, love, I know that's one thing that people at Microsoft love are acronyms. So the first couple days I was here, I was instructed that in any meeting I could raise my hand whenever there was an acronym I didn't understand, and my arms got really tired. So I'm picking up and moving on with that. Um, so CS, I've studied computer science. I have a bachelor's in computer science. I also studied psychology in the IE. It's not Internet Explorer. It's actually industrial engineering. Um, and so with all that put together, that makes me a human factors engineer. Um, in the last couple of years, though, I've been calling myself a universal design evangelist, because I feel that part of what I'm doing is getting the message out there about universal design. So what is it? Why is it cool? Uh, why is it important? Um, and so basically what I did was I went to school at Elmhurst College, and I was studying computer science. Um, actually, my story starts even younger than that. My dad was a computer scientist. And he brought home a computer, and I started programming when I was 12. So I was, always knew I was going to do something with computers, but I also love humans and how they interact with their environment. I just have always been very interested in that. So I'm studying computer science and psychology. One of my psychology professors says, I have a student who is studying statistics and he needs a tutor. Would you tutor him? Sure. I like people. I like stats. So I go meet with him and I discover he's blind. And I know nothing about blindness. Um, at the time, I don't think there was a disability student services office at our campus. I had no idea even to look for one. But I knew that I needed to teach him about bar graphs. 
And so I tried to figure out how to make that very visual information accessible to him. And I used Legos so that they were tactile and that we could have measurements of bars and create bar, gra bar graphs. I also poked holes in paper with a pin on a scatter plot so he could feel that. Um, and we just tried all sorts of different things. And since I was studying computers at the time, I kept thinking there's got to be a way that computers could be helping me do this. Like playing with Legos is totally fun, but there's got to be other ways that using these amazing machines that we've been working with that we ought to be able to help people use and learn and all of that. So I went off and I was a programmer for a while at the University of Chicago and kind of always had it in mind that I'd end up going to school somewhere, getting advanced degrees and all that kind of stuff, but didn't really know what that path would be. I, the experience with a student who was blind stayed with me. I was also a Special Olympics coach for a, gla a class of students with autism. So I kind of had all these things percolating in my mind. And so I'm at the University of Chicago and I read an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education about this guy at the University of Wisconsin who's creating technology for people and it's accessible. I thought, oh, that's cool. That's exactly what I want to know more about. So I ended up studying with him. Um, his name was Greg Vanderheiden. He ended up working with Microsoft, actually, in the early 90s to create some of the built-in accessibility features within Windows. Um, and at the time, I, went, I started that in 1995. This is kind of primarily what the web looked like in German. Um, this is one of the only screenshots I could find of this at the time. Um, and so for people who were blind, this actually worked really well because your screen reader could read everything that was on screen. So in the early versions of, of HTML, Tim Berners-Lee didn't have an image element. Um, he was more interested in connecting documents, having documents linked to each other. Um, so soon after, though, Mark Andreessen and the NSA, NS, NCSA project at University of Illinois um, he introduced the IMG element, and that kind of changed everything for people who were blind. Um, when you would go to a, a website now using a screen reader, one of the common things we'd see is just graphic, 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 graphic. Um, because then as soon as people discovered that they could put images up, they just put images up for everything, right? So they were just, that, the web just became graphic, graphic, graphic. So we started working on some guidelines. And so I was playing with one of my friends. Uh, Neil and I would play with web pages. And I would do things to make them work better with the screen reader. And that list of techniques that we came up with is what we started calling the page authoring guidelines. And so then we started talking with other people around the world about what they were doing. And some people were designing web pages for people with uh, physical disabilities and hearing disabilities. And so we realized that there were 40 sets of guidelines out there. And we combined them all into one at Trace. And uh, that became the basis of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So I don't know how many people have heard about the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Who knows what that is? So just a few people. Basically what happened is that um, the World Wide Web Consortium, so how many people know about the World Wide Web Consortium? Groovy. Um, so the World Wide Web Consortium does standards for the web, and one of the standards they decided to do was the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So since they were pushing the web forward, they wanted the web to go forward in such a way that people were creating websites, web content, web applications for people with disabilities. So this became an international standard. So that's what I worked on from 1997 to 2006. So the first version and the second version. And then it turned out that the, co the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines became the basis for um, policies and laws throughout the world. And so we would, we worked, I worked around the world doing stuff like that. So that means that I got to work with these two people. So the person on the left, that's Tim Berners-Lee, he invented the web. No, it wasn't Al Gore. And the person on the right who's talking is my co-author on the book that we ended up writing, Matt May. So we both worked on accessibility at W3C, and then we, when we left, wrote a book for O'Reilly. And um, since then, I've been doing all sorts of fun things. I went to food camp, and I was Wonder Woman in a comic, and I was an HTML5 super friend, and anyway, life's totally cool. And I was Geek of the Week, yes. <laughs> um, so basically, all I'm trying to say is that um, this is fun. 
this is really cool. Um, and I've had a really great time working on this problem. Now, not only is it a great problem because it's interesting as far as engineering goes, because you're working with such a variety of constraints, but it's the people that you get to work with and the good that you get to see done in the world. And it's my belief that it's through design that we can either create connections with each other or we can create barriers. And especially as we look at software and the web, where that is becoming the basis of most of interactions for how we do business, how we play, how we learn, um, where we get information, um, how we interact with people, it's really important that what we're doing is done in such a way that everyone can use it. So one of my favorite quotes is that it's stairs make a building inaccessible, not a wheelchair. And the reason I love that is it puts the onus on the designer, not the person. So if a person is trying to use your software, but they have some sort of ability that, or don't have an ability that you're requiring for them to use the software, it's your software at fault, not them. And so that's kind of the shift that I hope that we can make when we looked at, look at the design of, of software. So here I am now at Microsoft, my first corporate job. Um, and it's a really awesome time to be here because the world of accessibility and the expectations of consumers has completely changed. And um, we have an amazing opportunity to do really cool things here. So I'm very excited. Um, and it feels like everything in my life has kind of been building up to this moment in that I've been working to get the story straight and to figure out how to meet and address a variety of the needs that people have as they're developing software. So that's what I want to talk about today is this need of, you know, how do, we, how do we meet the developer's needs of having the information about what it takes to design for people with disabilities and how do we have this conversation so that the people with disabilities, their needs are being expressed. But also how do we broaden the story? Because it's not just about people with disabilities, it's about all of us. There's not an us and them, it's everybody. So let's expand that story. So how are we looking at that? So my understanding from my short four months here at Microsoft is that we have this governance program headed by Rob Haverty for accessibility. And we have a Microsoft accessibility standard, which we've been working hard to rewrite and make it even cleaner and uh, more effective. We need to blend that with knowledgeable people throughout the company so that the result is accessible products. And so that's, the, that's what Rick and Rob and I are going to be doing, which is a very exciting um, pro place to be. Um, oh, this is funny. So in this slide, the Connect got over, kind of got laid over with iPad. I didn't intend to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, little joke here. But at any rate, what this is, um, these are two stories that have been out in the last couple of weeks about accessibility. One is from the New York Times and the other is from MSNBC. Um, and I think no matter who you work for, these are really exciting stories because it shows that technology and the variety of people's needs, people with disabilities is hitting major stories. So one of the neat things is that the iPad um, because it is so easy to use, many uh, children with autism and other communication disabilities are using it as a communication aid. The reason that's so exciting is an iPad is what, $500? But some of the communication devices that people typically would need to use in order to communicate can be, be $8,000. So for 500 bucks, someone can have a device that everyone else has so that they don't look unusual because they're using something that like a Dynavox, looks like an assistive technology. They've got a cool device. They have a device that their friends have. If their friend has a device and they've forgotten theirs, they can use it because the accessibility is just built in. Same with Connect. Because Connect doesn't have a controller, this, this student, this kid with autism was able to just interact with it. And his parents have been very frustrated because they've been having trouble interacting with him and just connecting with him. And they were able to connect through Connect which they found really exciting. So in general, the, de the, the devices that are being created and the ways that we're beginning to interact with computers are becoming more accessible for all people and creating some really excellent stories and just experiences for all people. So I think this is a very exciting time to be involved in accessibility. 
Yeah. yeah. Do you happen to know if there are any plans to make Connect work for people who use wheelchairs? Because my understanding is that right now Connect only works for only recognizes you as a person if you are a standing person. I, I, I I'm not sure how to answer that. Okay. Question. Yes, please answer that. <laughs> um, is it? Because uh, uh, I'm Anne Marie Rohali, and I used to be the accessibility person for E and D before E and D was no longer E and D. But um, I've worked a lot with that group, and actually, it, it does sometimes work for people in wheelchairs, and it's really dependent on what type of chair they have and how you know, just like the shape of it and things like that. So, um, but they. They are experimenting with a lot of different things, you know, and, and there's different things that people can do, like where their feet are placed or things like that, to to try to get it to recognize where their <coughs> legs are and things like that. So sometimes if people can adjust their chairs, like the height or something, that makes it more apparent that, you know, I guess the like their legs, you know, are more vertical, um, because we actually had a um, a day. Well, we actually had two. Um, accessibility roundtable events, one which was in, for internal employees and one was for external um, like disability gaming organizations and we actually, Rob was there too and, and there were some people there with wheelchairs and it was kind of like for some people it worked okay and other people it didn't. Um, and in some cases part of it was not their legs either, it was their arms because there was one individual in particular where it couldn't tell the difference between the person's arm and and the joystick on there. So sometimes it sort of lost. Um, it thought that the joystick was was his arm and things like that. So, um, but they are you know working with a lot of different types of people and a lot of internal employees to try to get that better. Yeah, and that's something that I'm so curious about at Microsoft is how do products where do they start? And, and how can we get accessibility in sooner in the process so that products don't come out and then you have questions like that. Like it'd be great. That's what I mean by accessible at the alpha release. Like how do we ensure in the future that when products are released that they've thought about all of that before releasing the product, but at least they're working to make it work, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, no, I would actually speak that a little more strongly and say that the Connect team fully recognizes, and an article like this is, is a wonderful type of validation that the Connect as a tool has a lot of capability and a lot of future to it. And so they do recognize that uh, there's opportunities that they're going to be exploring and, and trying to uh, develop towards. And, and one other thing I can add is that um, it, it also varies. Um, from title to title. So some of the games, if they were written with the intent that the person would be playing it in a seated position, it will work better for someone who's in a wheelchair than if it expects to um, have an image of the full body. Because there's two different methods that Connect actually uses. One which is just for sort of the upper body and another one which requires um, an image of the entire body. So it's not like Connect per se, it, it also varies from title to title how the developer actually intended the game to be used. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so some, some myth busting, which is, I hope, part of the myth busting is also this is kind of shopping it, right? Because this is what I'm hoping to do with some, we're hoping to do with some of the developers and, and designers within Microsoft and other places. <laughs> um, but one of the things I've heard a lot in my career is that accessibility, it's not innovative. It's ugly, no one wants to use it, that's not, you know, I'm not concerned about that audience. I want to make products that are totally cool and blah, blah, blah. But um, I would like to point out that there are are a lot of ways that accessibility is incredibly innovative. Um, this is a picture of Stephen Hawking. And do you know that the, the way that he interacts with his computer is, it, is through his cheek? Um, there's, if you look at, if you search for uh, Ted Stephen Hawking, he did a TED talk recently. And in that, they actually 
it's a great talk on its own, but it also, they, they do all these different camera angles where you can see him interacting. He has a little sensor on his cheek, um, and then you can see how the, he's just clicking once to scan through and, and, and use his computer. Um, it's a really good demonstration of how you can do that. Um, and imagine if that interface had not been developed. Stephen Hawking, he's written um, books with this. He's done presentations. Um, imagine if we weren't able to access what's in that brain. But we can through technology and the people who created that interface. That's incredibly innovative. So I like to think of if you want to look at the future, if you want to be what's next, look at the accessibility area because I think that looking back, and I'm going to show you some of these things in a moment, if you look back at the history of development of technology for people with disabilities, these are the technologies we're using today. And these are technologies that people with disabilities have been using for decades. So I don't know. Can you think about how would other people use the sensor on your cheek? Something to think about. What if you were able to design products for Stevie Wonder, right? So Stevie, one of my favorite artists, so he's blind. Basically, he's living in an eyes-free world, right? Stephen Hawking is living in a hands-free world. If you were to design for both of these people, you would be creating a product that could be used in a car, which is basically an eyes-free, at least your, hand, your eyes are not going to be on the computer, hopefully, they'll be on the road, and a hands-free environment, such that hopefully your hands are not fumbling around with a device, but they're on the steering wheel. So if you can step back and look at the qualities of the interactions that these people are that we're designing for that's how you then begin to apply them to other places and that's how they become innovative so i like to say that inclusion is innovative incredibly innovative little wary to show this example here at microsoft but the iphone right this came out several years ago and when it first came out i was thrilled because pinch and zoom that ability to magnify Magnification was created for people with low vision ages ago. Screen magnifiers have been built into the, the Mac OS, Windows operating system uh, for ages. And part of the reason is that when people are giving presentations, they can zoom in, right? That's a side benefit of creating a technology, of using a technology that was created for someone with low vision. Because in instances, we all have low vision. And that's another thing to think about, is that if you design for people who may exist with low vision all the time, but think about how often we may end up in situations where we have low vision. The iPhone is an instance where we all have low vision. Any, any smartphone, we all have low vision, and that's why magnification is such an important feature on the smartphones. Also, word prediction. Notice these beautiful, these are, these are ads from the 1980s and 90s, obviously. So, Mighty Mouse, available on Windows 3.x, and the Soothsayer word prediction, and the on-screen keyboard. These are all technologies developed for people with disabilities, absolutely integral to smartphones, right? The, they've been using these technologies for ages. So again, this is where I feel like if you look at accessibility, you're looking at the future. Only now are these technologies really becoming part of mainstream technology. Now this example is just one of my favorites because it's a good story. Um, in the 1800s, uh, there was a countess and an inventor who lived in Italy. And he really wanted to exchange letters with her, but she was blind. So he invented her a keyboard, a typewriter. Of course, I love the story because I imagine that this was a love story and they were writing love letters because of course it's in Italy. But Think about that, right, in this need for being able to write a letter for someone who's blind, creating the typewriter. And there are many, many, many more examples of these. These are just a couple. Um, there are whole sites devoted to technologies developed for people with disabilities that have changed technology in the mainstream. So hopefully you can now agree with me that innovation or inclusion is innovation. Another myth that has some truth to it, I have to say. Accessibility is a tax. Um, it's been interesting, this is, it's been interesting in my career to hear people say this um, because I tend to see the opportunity in it. And because this is the way I think, I create things that are accessible just kind of automatically. 
And if you don't think that way and you have to learn and go through that, that learning curve, that learning curve is a tax, right? There, there's a cost there. And it's not always clear what the benefit is. So how can we help show that that learning curve is worth it? Um, and then also how can we decrease the cost of that learning curve, which is something else I'll talk about in a moment. But as I've been saying, if you create these products that are accessible for people with disabilities, you don't know how they might be used by other people. By making things easier in, for people with disabilities, you're usually making it easier for everyone in general. Um, the ease of use within Windows, um, part of that was recently changed. It used to be that there were accessibility features in Windows. But a lot of people don't identify as having a disability. Even people with disabilities don't identify often as having a disability, partly because they don't feel there's anything wrong with them. They aren't disabled. They just do things differently, right? We all do things differently. And so if you can reframe things such that how many people would use larger fonts on your computer, you'll have a much higher percentage of people saying that if, than if you ask the question, do you have low vision? People just don't identify with that, and for good reason, because there's such a stigma in culture and society around the world about, about disability. So there was a study by Microsoft that Forrester Research did um, that, that said 57% of current working age computer users would actually benefit from many of the accessibility features built into Windows. So it's not some small percentage of people with disabilities, but it's actually this larger percentage of people that are going to be using it. So inclusion broadens your audience. That also means it broadens the number of people you can sell products to, and the number of people that are just using your, your products and your ideas. So here are some more examples of that. This is a curb cut. Basically, these were designed for people using wheelchairs to go over the curbs. But they are used by people using roller luggage, people on bicycles, um, parents pushing strollers, so again, we're broadening the audience by just creating something with good design. How many people know about OXO Good Grips? So these, this was a, a couple who um, had been designing kitchen implements for quite a while, and the wife developed arthritis. So they created OXO. And they didn't market these as tools for people with, with any sort of arthritis or anything like that. They just marketed them as, hey, here are some great tools to use in the kitchen but again, inspired by uh, a need. And also then there's the market segment. So marketresearch.com yeah, market did a study and they showed that the top three market segments in the United States are boomers, seniors, and people with disabilities. And the interesting thing about that is that, um, I mean, how many people are aging? <laughs> I'm sorry, I love that question because sometimes people are like, oh, I'm not aging. Oh. Okay, right, every minute. <laughs> so, uh, right, so we're all aging. So anyway, so, so boomers, and, boomers are on their way to being seniors. And there are all sorts of statistics about as you age, how your vision and hearing and um, physical abilities change. And so you can also be using some of these ease of access features and all of that. Um, so another aspect of inclusive design is that not only you're reaching people when they're young, but you can continue to reach people throughout their lives. One of the interesting aspects of universal design, especially in the built environment, is the aging in place movement, where more and more people want to just stay in their home. They don't want to go to a senior center a retirement home. They want to stay in their own homes. And so there's design now for making our built environments more accessible. So nearly 52 million Americans have one or more disabilities, and that's 650 million people worldwide. So it's a big market segment, if, if you're interested in that. But again, getting back to that idea of tax and how to make it easier for people to create accessible products, is there a way that we, make, we can make it cheap and easy as well as good? So throughout working on the web, one of the things that people have tried to do is to make automated testing tools. Totally cheap, totally easy, not so good. 
Um, one of the examples is that you can very easily check to see if an image element on a web page has an alt attribute or not, but is that alt attribute any good or not is not something that is easy to test. Um, so this is a really interesting problem. I think this is and I don't say I don't think this is solved, and so I think this is one of the interesting things that we can all think about next. Especially, my favorite thing is to think about IKEA. Can we make accessibility kind of like IKEA products? They're well designed. They're easy to put together. The instructions are brilliant. Um, this is a kitchen. I just recently built this using instructions that looked like that, and. You know, is there a way where we can create this, access, this, this information for people who are developing products such that two people, two different developers are going to come out with something, something that is accessible? I think that would be a really good test of any materials that the governance team can produce. Um, but this is also something that I think we're actively doing. So if you have feedback and ideas, we want to hear them. Um, but I fully expect that the next version of Mass will look like that. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate, it's an interesting problem. I think this is this is kind of the crux of where I'm not seeing clear solutions yet. Another piece of it that I just love to talk about is how um, beauty and function equals power. Um, part of that is that I don't want us to just make things that are accessible. I want the things that are accessible to be beautiful. So often, when you look at these assistive technologies. When they first come out, they're so functional, and they really feel a need, but they are not pretty, and they're expensive. And so how can we make them beautiful, affordable, and powerful? So there have been some interesting things. There's a book by Graham Pollan, um, Design Meets Disability, and uh, Kristen pointed it out to me, and it's still uh, one of the most inspirational things I've had in the last couple of years. This is a picture of Amy Mullins on the left, and, um, and then there's a person climbing a rock wall. Um, but I would like you to look at her legs. It looks like she's wearing brown leather boots. Those are wooden legs, and they have been designed to, they've been carved. I believe Stephen McQueen, um, Stephen McQueen, Alexander McQueen? Shoot, I forget the designer's name. Some really amazing designer did, did these legs. And they've been carved in such a way that they have um, like grapes and flowers and all of these things in them. And they are gorgeous. I mean, they're a museum piece. And they're completely functional. Powerful, beautiful, functional. Like, let's try and do more of that. Eyeglasses. In the 1930s, people were so ashamed of having to wear eyeglasses. They were broken. They didn't have good sight. So initially, glasses were designed to be flesh-colored so that they would blend in with your skin, kind of like hearing aids are now. But now, glasses, you can go to kiosks and choose from millions of designs. So this accessibility aid has become fashionable. And so there are some interesting ideas out there about making hearing aids fashionable. What about other things? What about wheelchairs? What about bringing the cane back, you know, on the top hat. I mean, how do we make accessibility fashionable, powerful, beautiful, right? Not just functional. It's design, right? Design. Here's another aspect. This is a dance troupe that performed at the Seattle um, Art Museum recently. This is actually at the Sculpture Park. She can do things with wheels that we cannot do with legs. Beauty, function, I, I just, there's so much beauty in this area. I want more of that. So I think there are some challenges in this area. And I challenge you, smart people of the room and on the web, to help us do and create some of these things. Help us create cheap and easy. What is it going to take to make accessibility cheap and easy and beautiful? Is it just tools? Is it building accessibility into our libraries? Yeah, that'll help. Accessible by default. What else can we do? What haven't we thought of yet? Is there some way to create just customi uh, customizable input output? So there's been a lot of talk about going between the three screens, right? You can take Netflix and watch it on your computer at work, and then you can watch it on your phone, and then you can go home and watch it in your living room. What about other sorts of interactions that can go along between those? That can be on the fly interactions. It might change. I don't know. 
Um, we have the graphical user interface, which radically changed how people who were blind interacted with the computer, it changed how all of us interacted with the computer, right? It decreased the cognitive load, decreased just the understanding of how the computer worked such that all we had to do was point and click. Can we have some sort of auditory user interface? What about a tactile user interface? What other things can be developed in being inspired by disability, but imagining how that might be used in the mainstream? How might those other interfaces change how everyone is using computers? And what else can you think of? I mean, one of my favorite movies is Robots. How many people know the movie Robots? Anyway, it's a fantastic movie. It's a kid's movie. But there's, it's all about inventions. And one of the main inventors says, see a need, fill a need. And that's one of my favorite maxims. And I hope that that's one thing I can leave all of you with today. So in conclusion, inclusive design increases your audience. It's incredibly innovative. It should be incredibly beautiful. Um, you can not only empower a minority group, but you can empower everyone. And so uh, I think you all are the gatekeepers to this new world. If you are at Microsoft, I encourage you to get involved. We have um, the WAC WAC Enable page. We have the APQ alias for questions. Um, and there's a whole team of us doing accessibility here at Microsoft. Um, so I want to thank you very much for being here. If you want to get in touch with me, I am on Twitter, although less so these days. Um, and I have a blog, although I've been doing less of that these days. But I am WendC at Microsoft.com. So thank you very much. And I think we have time for questions if anyone has questions. Yeah. <laughs> so um, over the last 15 years that I've come over to Microsoft and talked to people related to accessibility, the, the philosophy has always been that, uh, you know, that they'll have a, in quotes, open system, you know, and provide the hooks for third parties to go in and give, um, provide uh, accessibility. And uh, but then you know um, there are it's sort of a some kind of change that happened with uh, voiceover on iPhones, and there the you know they just their philosophy is it's going to be Apple that this is going to be built in. And I was wondering if there's any chance that Microsoft will come in that direction. But, uh, I know there's some stuff that's built into uh, you know you can get some uh, accessibility tools within Microsoft, but it's, they're still relying on third parties, basically, to provide accessibility. Right. This is where I get to claim I'm a newbie and hand it over to, <laughs> to Rob. <laughs> I'm not so, allowed to answer those things yet. No. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I'm Richard Leibniz from the University of Washington. Yes, and I'm Rob Haverty, and I know who you are, and uh, just have not had a chance to meet you. Um, so that is, that is really almost the $64 million question um, that's being asked externally today. It's not just a Microsoft question. Is what are we doing around the ecosystem for assistive technologies, for uh, integrating and, and developing interoperability? Um, I don't have a great answer for you because it is the question, really. We, we haven't fully answered it. Um, it is something we're exploring um, today. You're right, we have some things already built in. We have a very good uh, speech recognition engine built into Windows 7. We have um, a magnifier. And, and that really is sort of the direction that things are going, is that there needs to be this built-in ability. But there also needs to be that, that flexibility that Microsoft always has provided by providing the hooks. Because um, yes, you know, there are built-in products that work fine, but they don't work excellently for everyone and for every need. And so we're really looking at what is that correct ecosystem, what is the right model to have functionality and also allow flexibility. Um, and so I would actually, I mean, my answer would be say, stay, stay tuned. I think you're going to hear a lot more in the next 12 to 18 months on that out of Microsoft. Any other questions? Yeah. I've heard a lot of 
people are not pleased with the accessibility of Windows Phone 7. Um, for example, not having a screener built in. And my understanding is actually not even really having the ability for a third party to make a screen reader if they wanted to. I wonder if you guys could comment a little bit about what the story with that and what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, she, she, can, she came on to fix all of this for us. Um, that is another really good question. Um, and much like the Connect question earlier, um, we did recently also have a summit with um, many of the major uh, blind organizations and advocacy groups worldwide uh, to talk specifically about the mobile devices and, and Windows Phone 7 and what we needed to do to, to uh, improve that, that functionality. Um, absolutely correct. We do not have a screen reader today uh, for Windows Phone 7. Um, it is not possible to hook one in today. Um, one of the challenges and one of the things that um, we want people to be sure to recognize is it's kind of interesting when you take a device like the Windows Phone, which we've already had, and you have Windows Phone 6.5, which does have screen reader capability, um, and, and screen readers available for it. And then you go to a Windows Phone 7 where you think, oh, well, it's, it's a um, next step. It's like, you know, Windows XP, Windows 7, whatever. You know, we're, we're moving forward. Well, we didn't move forward. We rewrote the entire platform. So Windows Phone 7 is a brand new platform. Anytime you're going to do that, there's going to be resource issues. There's going to be challenges as to what we can get into that initial platform. Um, we have met with, you know, uh, National Federation of the Blind, American Council of the Blind, American Foundation of the Blind, ONCE, which is the Spanish Blind Organization, um, the Royal National Institute of the Blind from the UK, all came on campus together to talk about what our roadmap would be and how we would get from where we are today to where we can have a fully functioning phone for, um, for all of our users. Again, coming back to Wendy's discussion about design, it isn't... We try really hard here at Microsoft not to focus on a specific category of user. The idea is to make sure things work for all users. Um, so that is, that is in development also. Um, today, no, there is not a screen reader for, uh, for Windows Phone 7. There are screen readers for Windows Phone 6.5. Um, and you'll be, again, you'll be seeing over the next probably 12 months or so, and I'm kind of looking at um, Chuck, who is on the Windows Phone 7 team, um, that you know, it'll be in the next 12 months or so that you'll hear, be hearing more information about that and exactly what that roadmap is because we're in the process now of specking that and planning that. In fact, when Chuck walked in this morning, I said, what are you doing here? You should be working on the specs for the next Phone 7 release. Um, so you know, that, that is what we're doing. But yes, absolutely. Is, uh, so you focused on uh, the screen reading function. Are there other accessibility functions that are being uh, no, also being worked on for uh, the phone? That's a really great question. There actually are a lot of other accessibility functions already built into the phone. There are a number of things. And one of the things that we have to look at is what are the, what are the legal requirements, what are the legislation, what are the regulations? And in the phone space, there are a lot of regulations because there's, there's for the United States, there's um, Section 255 of the Telecommunication Act that speaks about accessibility. And we actually have to document where we fall in that space. And we have a lot of things. If you look at the matrix, there's a lot of things that are green. We do have a lot of functionality available from a phone standpoint. The, the challenge is, or the thing that we have to recognize when we're looking at mobile devices is there's a phone, and then there's all the other cool stuff that you can do on a smartphone like IE and play games and all that other stuff. And I had a friend showing me the Windows Phone 7 and I got trapped into playing the games and you know, I was like, oh, I won't work for the rest of the day because these games are really cool. Um, so there is a lot of functionality built in today um, around accessible phone services uh, for Windows Phone 7. It is, I, I think it's fair to say that the challenges rest in the broader space of a smartphone. And, and the mobile device space. But yeah, there's, I mean, and Chuck, maybe you can, you know, Wendy, I, in fact, I was, <laughs> I was thinking in Wendy's presentation when she was showing uh, the iPhone and saying, you know, you can, you've got the little 
expand and the magnify thing. And it's like, oh, I, I just saw that on the Phone 7. So, you know, there's a lot of those kind of features that are available today for, for accessibility. You know, there is some voice commanding for... All the phone functions are completely accessible with the wired headset headphones or Bluetooth device. Uh, you can plug in a TTY device to the audio jack. It's fully supported. We have uh, hearing aid compatibility in our uh, chassis spec for low interference with hearing aids. So there are uh, a number of things that we work on. So we just didn't get to it. And that's not just accessibility on the phone. I had heard that uh, the iPhone supports some sort of captioning functionality. I don't know if that would right and if we had anything to come on. Uh, captioning for, for video? For if you have a video delivered. Uh, yeah, so, so Windows Phone 7 doesn't support closed captioning. Under our So yeah, maybe it should be easier for those things to happen in the future. Good, big question, <laughs> right? Helping the product teams uh, make it possible is a really good question for us right now. All right. Well, cool. Thanks a lot. Thank mm -hmm. you.